Although Qui-Gon Jinn preferred to settle problems without drawing blood, there was one beast in the galaxy so horrifying that he would kill it on sight whenever he encountered it. What was this beast? And why did Master Qui-Gon, a wise force user who would often allow beasts and predators to hunt freely, feel the need to butcher it? Join us as we discover the truth in today's underrated moment. The Outer Rim world of Aurora was thick with dense, green-leaved forests. But perhaps, more than the waves of vegetation, the heavy question of life and death were slowing Obi-Wan Kenobi down the most. As he trailed behind Master Qui-Gon, pushing his way through a sharp thicket of ferns, Kenobi couldn't help but question his teacher's wisdom. Only a day prior, when a group of semi-sentient aliens tried to hunt and devour a creature known as a Mosco, Qui-Gon decided to intervene. But later that night, when Mosco betrayed them and tried to kill the pair of Jedi in order to steal their possessions, Qui-Gon cut him down and he didn't seem to feel conflicted about it. That troubled Kenobi. As much as Jin insisted that he was simply carrying out the will of the Living Force, Obi-Wan was desperate to find a line of consistency in Jin's actions. But to the young apprentice, who had only recently completed the trial of constructing his own blue lightsaber, Master Qui-Gon's behavior only seemed to be guided by one thing whatever he felt like doing at the time. So when the pair reached the crest of a nearby mountain and got a clear view of the rest of the plateau, Kenobi was afraid of what his master might say. In the distance, a tall spire-like mountain carved a hole in the sky as it punctured a passing layer of flat, lifeless clouds. Do you sense anything about it? Master Qui-Gon asked his student as he quietly moved next to him. Puzzled by the question, Kenobi floated his mind into the force and tried to sense a disturbance. I'm not sure, Obi-Wan replied. Disappointed that he couldn't pick up on what his master had obviously already deduced about the ominous landscape, it looks sinister to me, Obi-Wan said, hoping that Jin would finally fill him in. But the answer didn't come quickly. The pair braced the straps of their brown leather packs and carefully descended down the other side of the slope, careful not to trip on the mud-covered stones which were made even slicker by the sudden arrival of rain. Kenobi and Jin progressed closer and closer to a mysterious brown object on the other side. Beneath them, a large reservoir of brackish brown water waited and within it, a massive clay monument. With rows of rib-like pillars on either side and a horribly tortured face in the center, Kenobi was shocked. He had never seen anything like it, and he was afraid. As a Jedi, he knew that he would have to take on terrifying new challenges, but that foresight didn't help to calm his nerves. What is it? He asked through a hushed voice, holding on to an exposed tree root as his feet blindly searched for footing. Qui-Gon was already several meters ahead of him, almost to the bank of the strange lake. He had a clearer view of the mysterious structure, but with his years of careful study under Count Dooku, it was obvious to Jin what this was. A sacrificial altar, Jin said, as he also whispered, Kenobi wondered if his master was afraid, but he wasn't brave enough to ask. Instead, the young Padawan waited eagerly for his master to explain more, but he received an answer that he wasn't expecting, one that struck his heart cold. To a Cylon, it evidently lives in that mountain. A Cylon? Kenobi shouted. He knew of them, but he could have sworn they were myths. As the pair of Jedi walked past spires of skulls stacked neatly one on top of each other, he couldn't believe his master had dragged him into this situation. By now, the rain had changed from a soft drizzle into a downpour, and the rust-colored sediment in the lake was quickly agitated, turning the water even redder, an ominous sign of what was to come. Well, let's get out of here then, Kenobi begged. He couldn't help it, but he found himself counting all the different species that were represented among the skulls, and the realization that the Cylon was responsible for their deaths terrified him. There were Zabrak, Deveronian, Chagrain, humans, and even Quarren. Jin understood his apprentice's emotions. When he was younger, Jin himself might have simply turned from the altar and pretended as though he had never seen it in the first place. But now, with so much of the galaxy changing and the threat of the dark side consciously weighing on his mind, Jin knew he wouldn't cut and run. I sent something urging me forward. Qui-Gon told his Padawan, Aware of what his master was about to say next, Kenobi braced for the thing that had been troubling him during their entire trip to Aurora. It isn't every day a Jedi has the opportunity to rid the universe of a Cylon. This is something I must do. 
The living force is directing me. There it was again. The confusing will of the force that always seemed to be telling Qui-Gon who, what, and when to kill. And today it was directing him into the very den of a creature that could slaughter an entire Republic patrol fleet without even injuring one of its tendrils in the process. Wondering whether Kenobi would join him or not, Qui-Gon inquisitively stated, You aren't coming. When Kenobi, unwilling to let his master face the beast on his own, chose to act against his own judgment, he still wasn't sure why the Force willed them to save certain animals and to kill others. But he wouldn't allow the confusion to put Qui-Gon's life at risk. I'm not going to let you face a Cylon alone. There's no way, Kenobi boldly stated. Qui-Gon's chest swelled as he took an unnecessary breath of the humid, aurorian air. This was his Padawan, and although they might have conflicted views on the Force, the way Kenobi bravely chose to fight by his side couldn't help but cause him to balloon with pride. Although the monument in the lake was prepared for the Cylon, it was only the very tip of its territory. The beast's range was immense, but its lair was in the towering mountain that the Jedi had seen from the foot of the jungle several kilometers away. Sensing that one of its great beasts would soon die, the planet seemed to unleash rain in greater fury. Kenobi and Jin tightly wrapped their thick brown cloaks over their head and held them closed with their hands. But staying dry was an utmost impossible feat. As the rain penetrated their outer layers and drenched their clothes, from the top of their tunics to the bottom of their socks, the pair pushed forward. Crossing a field of razor-sharp slate, Jin tried to steal courage in his Padawan. Keep the living force present in your mind, Obi-Wan, he said. Qui-Gon knew more about the beasts that they were about to face than any other Jedi in the Order. We are in the presence of one of the primordial creatures of the dark side. Focus your attention on this moment, Obi-Wan. Let the living force act through you. By nightfall, the Jedi had crawled into the heart of the mountain and followed the slime-covered tendrils of the slumbering Cylon to his den. When they had crawled far enough, Qui-Gon reached his hand beneath his cloak and grabbed hold of a slender black and silver cylinder attached to his belt. As his fingers wrapped around the lightsaber, a wave of memories flooded over him. This weapon had served him through many trials, and today it would have to serve once more. Signaling to Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon blindly thumbed the switch on the side of his blade, illuminating the cave with light for the first time in centuries. Beneath them, a dozen ferocious mouths suddenly opened, revealing hundreds of sharp, porcelain-like fangs. Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon bobbed on the tendrils above for a second longer, then quickly leapt down, preparing to meet the beast's fangs with their green and blue blades. Almost blinded by the enormity of their opponent, Kenobi and Qui-Gon could barely hope to hit a critical strike. They didn't have the time to search for a single heart, which the Cylon's dozen mouths all shared. If they stopped swinging for even a second, the monster would have enough time to devour them. Instead, the pair kept striking with their weapons, hacking the monster and its tendrils bit by bit. In the end, Kenobi and Jin's blind, messy attacks were enough, and they successfully killed the Cylon, leaving its gray corpse lifeless in a pool of its own blood in the heart of the mountain. When the master and apprentice emerged from the cave, Kenobi was even more troubled than he had been the day before and he once again brought his feelings to his master. Did we truly do the right thing by killing the Cylon? Kenobi asked. After silently contemplating the battle and the mountain all evening, it felt so awful to take such a large life. And then Qui-Gon admitted something that Obi-Wan never expected to hear. It was unpleasant for me too, his master said, as he rested against a vine-covered tree, a roaring fire casting orange reflections against his face. Even though Qui-Gon allowed the Force to guide his actions, he couldn't help but question them himself. And that's something he tried to explain to his apprentice. We are Jedi. Our lives are not ours to live as we wish. We are pledged to serve a higher power than ourselves. That was a point that Kenobi had heard many times before, and in the light of killing such a massive animal, certainly one of only a handful in the galaxy, Kenobi felt like he had to properly debate. I thought serving the living force meant having respect for all creatures. The Cylon had its place in the natural scheme of things, didn't it? It only did as its nature told it to do. What right had we to seek it out and destroy it? It wasn't harming us. When Kenobi finished speaking, he could feel his face fill with red as his confusion temporarily turned to frustration. Throughout their training on Aurora, Qui-Gon had excused their killing of others by claiming he was only defending himself 
and at the same time when they allowed other creatures to be killed by more powerful predators. Qui-Gon explained that they shouldn't interfere because the cycle of life and death was part of the natural world. But in this duel with the Cylon, Qui-Gon certainly contradicted each and every one of his previous explanations. The Cylon wasn't actively attacking anyone, and it certainly wasn't trying to harm them. For a moment, the Master simply stared into the fire. But then, when the silence seemed to be deafening, he spoke. The ways of the living force are beyond our understanding. Who knows why we are directed to exterminate that beast? Perhaps we were against our retribution. Perhaps we were performing an act of liberation. We cannot know. We can only serve. It was hardly the answer that Kenobi had been hoping for. But he knew that his master trusted his belief in the Force, and perhaps over time, Kenobi he himself would find the same faith. <laughs>